So our Algebra 2 curriculum starts off with us talking about algebraic expressions. And the first concept that I want to talk to you about is what the exponent really represents. So when you have 2 to the 5th power, that means you have 5 2's being multiplied together. So that would be really cumbersome to type on a calculator 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. So we just type 2 and then to the 5th power, or hopefully at some point in your life you'll know that that is equal to the number 32. Uh, the same can be uh, done for exponents with variable bases instead of numeric bases. Uh, and says here, each of the variables are their own separate base. So I have x with another x, another x. So simplifying that would be x to the third power. And then two y's multiplied together would be y squared. We're going to leave off. Sorry, I just ran out to go yell at my kids. All right, so we're on letter B, looks like. Um, our expression is 4x times another 4x times another 4x. So that would be 4x is the base raised to the third power, and then 3y, 3y would be 3y raised to the second power. Now notice I have parentheses around the entire base of 4 and x, because I could also separate that as 4 to the third power, x to the third power, 3 to the second power, y to the second power, and I could simplify further, but we're trying to illustrate what exponents do. So here for part c, it has 6n four times, so that's the quantity, 6n raised to the fourth power, and then a random subtract 3 off to the side. So talking about parentheses and the use of parentheses on your calculator, we're going to have a really big difference when we use parentheses and when we don't. And we have to be careful whether we want to use parentheses or not. For instance, if I want to take the base of negative 3 and raise that entire base to the fourth power, if I type it in exactly like that on my calculator, my calculator will follow order of operations and do exactly 4 negative 3's multiplied together, giving me a positive 81. Now on the contrary, if I were to type a negative symbol and then 3 raised to the fourth power, my calculator sees that as a negative coefficient and then only 3 as the base raised to the fourth power. So it's going to pop out a negative 81. So we get this every year where there's some kid who's very heavily dependent on the calculator who says, oh, my calculator gave me the wrong answer. And that's not, what, that's not at all what's happening. Um, it's user error, unfortunately, and you've got to be careful that you're typing in what you mean to type in. So talking about order of operations, yes, your calculator will follow order of operations perfectly, assuming that you are typing them in perfectly. But it is nice of us to remember how to do order of operations without a calculator. So parentheses first, and then exponents, multiply and divide is the same step, and then add and subtract, moving left to right. Now, talking about parentheses is kind of weird because sometimes there are what we call implied parentheses. We're going to see that on another section coming up. But for instance, here on part A, Inside the parentheses, I have negative 2 plus 5, which would be a 3. So my problem becomes negative 4 plus 2 times 3 squared. And then I've taken care of the parentheses. So now my exponent would be 3 squared. So just the base of 3 squared would be a 9. So negative 4 plus 2 times 9. And then multiplication comes next. So negative 4 plus that becomes an 18. And then my answer pops out as a 14. Now, I know you're saying, Abruzzo, I could have just typed that on my calculator, had the answer like four years ago. Um, but there is a non-calculator portion of the SAT test that's going to come up for most of you this year. Um, also, it's just kind of, you know, nice. If you don't have to rely on technology for all of your mental math, you want to be able to stretch yourself a little bit. So part B tricks kids every year because of that first uh, term of the expression where it says negative and then 5 squared. Notice there's no parentheses around the 5 or the negative 5. So that means that it's just squaring the 5 and not the negative symbol. So um, I'm going to go ahead and take care of this part first, even though I know it's technically not the first step. So that's actually going to become a negative 25 because I'm just squaring the 5 and then throwing a negative in front. Plus 3, but now I should have already taken care of the parentheses. 2 minus 6 is negative 4. I'm going to square that right now. Negative 4 squared. This time negative is in parentheses. So we're squaring negative 4, meaning that's 16. So negative 25 plus 3 times 16. Oh gosh, I got I just gave you a big speech about not using a calculator, and now I'm too tired to think. Let's see, plus 48. Let's see, let's see. Negative 25 plus 48 is like 48 minus 25, so mm, 23. And then part C here, I don't see any parentheses. There also are no implied parentheses, uh, meaning a numerator versus a denominator. So there's no exponents either. That's fun. Um, I do see a multiplication problem right here, though. So I'm going to do that first. We have 3 plus now a 20 minus a 4. And then order of operations goes from left to right at this point because we're all on the fourth level. So that's 23 minus 4. So that's what, 19? 
Again, all of those could have been done on your calculator beautifully, assuming you can type them in properly, but it's always good to be able to do them without a calculator. Now, when we're evaluating algebraic expressions, that means that our expression has both numerical and variable components to it, and then sometimes we're going to give you a value to substitute into the expression in place of that variable. So, for instance, here, negative 3 times x squared minus 5 times x plus 7. Evaluate this when x equals negative 2. So the not-so-proper math term that a lot of us math teachers use is plug it in. Um, this is not an electrical outlet. There's nothing to plug, um, but it's a cutesy way for little kids to remember what we're talking about. So an expression, an algebraic expression, means that in place of the variable, which I'm going to currently write as just a big empty parenthesis, we're going to substitute in whatever value they gave us. So negative 2 is going to go in right here and right here. And then, without the use of a calculator, I would use the order of operations to simplify this. So remember, parentheses first, there's nothing within the parentheses to calculate, um, but I would see that this right here, negative 2 squared, is an exponent level. So this negative 3 stays for a moment, but negative 2 squared is going to become a positive 4 minus... Um, I'm, gonna, I'm about to do the multiplication step, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to kind of skip here. Negative 5 times negative 2 is 10, positive 10. Um, so I should have already simplified this, negative 12 plus 10 plus 7. Oh, it's a Monday night. Let's see, negative 12 plus 10, negative 2 plus 5 is, or plus 7 is 5. So this expression comes out to a value of 5 when evaluated at x equals negative 2. We're going to learn more about function notation in the near future. Um, and you, oh, that's not even right, Abruzzo. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, I told you, it's Monday night. Give me a break. Um, but for most of us, on a Monday night, we're tired, we're doing homework, I probably would have just grabbed a calculator and typed this in because I'm pretty comfortable with a calculator at this point. But, you know, it's good to be able to stretch. All right, let's talk about combining like terms when we're simplifying algebraic expressions. So there are terms that are separated by either addition or subtraction signs in, an, in a polynomial. Um, 2x and 4 are the two different terms that I see here. They are not like terms at all. Um, this one is what we call x to the first power, a first degree, and this is a constant. Um, 2, the number that's in front of the variable, that is called a coefficient. And then 4, the term that doesn't have any variable component, is called a constant. So when I look at this next example, I have 3x plus 7 minus 2x plus 8. And I notice that this polynomial does have some terms that are like. So, for instance, there's a 3x later on being subtracted by a 2x. And if I were to combine those terms together, 3 minus 2 of them gives me 1x, which I can just write as x. And then my constant terms are positive 7 combined with a positive 8. So it would be a positive 15. Sometimes kids get combining of like terms confused with when we solve equations and they try to do opposite operations. Um, we're going to get to that in the next lesson, but you're going to see a very key difference as to when you do an opposite, like a plus 7 turns to a minus 7. We'll talk about what that means next lesson, but this is not that. So we're going to combine like terms and simplify this um, these expressions, and sometimes you can give answers in different formats. So we're going to try to always answer in what's called standard form. We'll learn more about that in the future. But here, 7x and 4x would combine to an 11x. Um, in this next problem, the only combinable terms are the n squared terms. We're going to learn later that's a quadratic term. So 3n squared minus 1n squared is 2n squared so when I combine those. And then there's still that 1 plus, plus 1n. These are not like terms that you can combine. This is n to the first power, and this is n to the second power. And that's why they're different terms. So in this next example, we're actually multiplying these two numbers together. So we're going to distribute 3x, so 3x times 8x, remember, is 24x squared. And then 3x times negative 6 is negative 18x. Neither of these are like terms, because again, this is x to the second power, this is x to the first power. So um, you don't have to write that first power there, that's a little confusing, let me get rid of that. So here on number 5, a little more fun, we're going to have distribution of the 4x. And then we will have some like terms to collect, I think, in a minute. So let's see, 4x times 5x is 20x squared, and then plus 16x. But then off to the side of that distribution term is a minus 18x. So now it looks like we do have some like terms to collect right here. I have 16x minus 18x. When I push those together, it becomes a minus 2x. And then there's nobody to collect with the 20x squared. 
So that would have been my final expression answer. Careful on this next one. Um, there's double distribution. Look at this. 2x plus 2. Now careful. This is a subtracting a 3, but he's being multiplied by this as well. So we can think of this as distributing a negative 3. So that becomes a negative 3x and then a plus 12. So, fun times. We have a couple like terms here. 2x minus 3x becomes negative 1x. So I'm just going to write that as negative x. And then um, plus 2, plus 12, pushed together is a plus 14. Sorry about the handwriting. Summer and handwriting sloppy. All right. Distributing a 4 to this expression. And then this time it's a positive 3, so we don't have to worry so much about the distribution of the positive. So that becomes a 4x minus 8 plus 3x plus 12. And now we have a couple of like terms to collect again. So 4x, uh, 3x is 7x, and then negative 8 plus 12 is plus 4. I know these seem pretty basic because you did a whole bunch of this in Algebra 1, but it's been a long summer for everybody, so let's get back in gear. Uh, oh, number eight, fun times. We have distribution. The secondary distribution has a negative, and then there's like weird variable parts all over the place. So let's start with 6x times x, which is 6x squared plus 30x on the next term. And then careful on this one, we got a negative 7. So a negative 7x, careful here, negative negative is a positive 7x squared. So when I look at my like terms, I notice that the 6x squared and the plus 7x squared will now combine together to give me 13x squared. And then plus 30x minus 7x pushed together is a plus 23x. Now, I know I made a big to-do about not using your calculator and, you know, being proud of yourself for not doing any calculator work. But if you're on a summative or something important like the SAT test and you are given a calculator and you feel like this is a moment where you might be making a mistake, by all means, grab the calculator, double check your mental math, but, you know, do yourself a favor and make an attempt at the mental math before you check it on the calculator and then register like, oh, goodness, that was not right. And then think to yourself why you didn't do it right, because that's how we learn those mental math steps. And I know after the first couple of grades of elementary school, they don't make you do too much mental math. I give you a calculator pretty quickly these days. Um, but you'll thank me in the long run, guys, I promise. <laughs> All right. So this problem, um, you have $50 and you're going to buy some movies on DVD that cost $15 a piece. Write an expression that shows how much money you have left after buying a mystery number of movies and movies. And then we're going to use that expression. We're going to evaluate it when I buy two movies versus when I buy three movies. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is a really dumb problem because like would i really pull out some algebra to figure this out no i'd probably just think really hard or you know worst case scenario to show up to the store and try to buy some things um but think bigger picture here so we're giving you a very basic simple example of how algebra can be used to essentially program something like a cash register or a computer something that has to think really quickly um and algorithmically all the time and it can't be a person. So a person has to program this machine to think like a person. That's the cool part. So the verbal model is how your brain very quickly registers what's happening in the problem. But the verbal model is cool because it puts either um, words, phrases. Sometimes we can use, even use pictures. Like when little kids do this, they draw pictures. So the original amount is what you're going to start with when you walk into the store. And then you're going to subtract off two things that are being multiplied together. So if we think about that, that's going to be um, the cost of each movie but if we buy more than one movie we're also going to have to multiply that by the number of movies and then once i figure out the subtraction problem that's how much amount i'm going to have left or how much change i'm going to get so this is essentially how they program cash registers to work so you know the, the kid who presses a cash register at target doesn't get paid that much money guys but the person who programs the cash register for target gets paid a ton of money. So let's talk about plugging in what we know here. So the original amount is $50, I believe. Yeah. And then I know each movie costs $15, but then we're going to multiply it by how many movies we buy. But they told me to kind of leave that in what we call the general term. So they're going to say, just call it N for now. And that's the algebraic expression that represents how much money we're going to have left. So if I take that algebraic expression now and my customer buys two movies, 
then I quote plug in or evaluate this expression at 2. Whoops. So what's that 30, right? 50 minus 30 would be $20. So this person has $20 change. Um, but in another situation, when my, uh, my customer or myself, whoever, uh, purchases three movies at 50 minus 45, that means this person has $5 left. So it's kind of neat. And I know it was a very basic problem. But just remember, the cash registers aren't like magical creatures that you know, pop out of the factory knowing what they're doing. Some human has to program things to work. So let's look at this example. You want to buy a CD or a DVD for a gift for each of 10 people. And CDs cost $13 and DVDs cost $19. You're going to write an expression for the total amount of money you spend. And then you're going to evaluate the expression when four of the people get CDs. So this is kind of an interesting idea because... If I let you use two variables, this is going to be a really easy problem. But if I only let you use one variable, then this becomes a little more challenging, but more streamlined when it comes to programming like machines. So if we start with um, total amount of money. Okay, so the total amount of money that we're going to spend is going to be represented by um, the cost of CDs, which is $13. But then we're going to have to multiply it by how many people get CDs. And I don't know that right now. We're going to hold off on this clue for a moment. So let's just call that X. But then $19 for every other person. And this is where it gets kind of exciting. So instead of saying Y or some other variable represents how many people get DVDs, remember, I only have 10 friends and I'm only buying for 10 people. So like, for instance, if I bought four people a CD, six people would be getting a DVD. Another example, if I bought two people a CD, eight people would be getting a DVD. And the way I'm getting that number is I'm figuring out how many people I still have remaining from my 10 people, so 10 minus X. So this is kind of a nifty way to write an algebraic expression using just the one variable, because I know that whatever number goes here and here, they're related to each other by this number 10. I kind of snuck in a system of equations there on you. We'll talk more about that later. So now we're going to evaluate this expression when four people get CDs. So it's going to be 13 times 4 plus 19 times 10 minus 4. And, I'm, you know, guys, I'm tapping out on my mental math today. I'm just going to go ahead and type this in my little handy calculator. 13 times 4 plus 19 times, I can take a bit of a shortcut and call that 6. I guess we're doing $166. Just really love your friends. All right. There we go. So. Um, this is going to be kind of fun. We have some more complicated algebraic expressions. We're going to want to simplify these answers. Uh, I'm going to say go ahead and use your calculator when appropriate, but we're going to talk about what I referred to earlier as implied parentheses coming up in a problem here. So x to the fourth plus 3y when x equals 2 and y equals negative 8. So x equals 2, i got to concentrate here because I have a problem sometimes with concentration, 3 times negative 8. And, you know, guys, I seriously have no problems whatsoever if you just grab a calculator and do this. Now, I have a really awesome calculator. I have a TI-84 plus CE emulator. So, I will warn you, it's a little low um, as far as, like, action time. <laughs> um, it also is very bulky on my screen and hides half my work. So, 2 to the 4th power plus 3 times negative 8. So... 2 to the 4th power, I'd just use the caret key right there. Now, if you have to get out of your caret, arrow over, um, plus 3 times negative 8. And you don't really need those parentheses I used because there's no other operations happening outside of those parentheses. Apparently, the answer is negative 8. All right. Good news. Um, if I need to show you something on the calculator, I'll pull up that, baby. But um, I'm going to probably do my own on my handheld calculator here. Now, be careful here on letter B. It's 3 times x, and then that product raised to the second power. So 3 times x, which is also 3, that raised to the second power, minus 7, and then times x squared. I don't know if that was a typo or what. It's a little boring. You know, change that to y. I just feel like it. Um, y squared would become 2 squared. I could probably do this in my head. Let's see. That's 9. 9 squared is 81. Speak too fast to Brazil. All right, that's 7 times 4. That's 28. And you know what, guys? 8 always get me. 
85 minus 28 is 53. All right. Again, I don't want to bit myself out here on YouTube. Uh, so if you need to grab your calculator, please do. Um, I've been doing math for a lot of years, and like I said, it's very late on a Monday night after my kids have gone to bed, and I'm too tired to do mental math right now. Here is a great example of while I don't mind you using your calculator, you really have to be careful about how you use it. So 5 times x, which is 6, he's being divided by 2 thirds, which is y, um, and then minus x again, which is 6. Now, this is where it's going to get kind of confusing. So on your calculator, this I will show you. When you divide by a fraction, your calculator views things horizontally. I don't know if you can tell by the way it's typing. But when I do 5, and then a multiplication sign and parentheses imply the same thing on your calculator. So 6, if I hit a division sign right now, it's going to keep typing horizontally. So if I just do like 2 divided by 3, it's going to think I'm only dividing by the 2. So what I need to have happen here is I need to divide by 2 thirds in a set of parentheses like so. And then I have to close the other parenthesis that I opened in front of the 6. And then remember the back end of that expression was minus 6. 39. There's a lot of ways we could have messed that guy up. So, um, again, I have no issues with you using your calculator, especially on something like that. Um, we'll talk a lot about fraction work later on in this course. Um, what happens when you divide by a fraction? We're going to go back to this grade again, but now is not the time. I don't want to scare you too much on the first day x squared, so negative 3, we're going to have to square that whole expression, and then we're dividing by 2 times y plus 1. So here, if you're going to rely on your calculator, I have no issues with that, but you're going to have to realize that this denominator has implied parentheses around it. So when you type on your calculator, you are literally going to have to type negative 3 squared divided by, and then you're going to have to open a parenthesis, 2 times 2 plus 1, because your calculator will not understand that this whole denominator is the whole denominator until you tell him with parentheses. So I don't know, does it become 9 over 5? Oh, by the way, they wanted improper fractions. If I just typed this in, it probably gave me, uh, oh gosh, uh, 1.8. So when I hit math, enter, enter, which I'll take you here. So, nine. so after I did all my calculations, I ended up with 1.8, right? And then if I want that to convert back to an improper fraction, you hit the math menu, and the first option says two fraction. So you say enter, and then it's like, are you sure you want to do that? And you say yes by hitting enter, and then it goes back to nine fifths. All right. So next part is a little flash uh, of geometry. That was last year. So let's talk about area of a figure. So this particular figure in part A is a triangle. So if you remember, an area of a triangle is one half times the base times the height. So it says set up an area expression. So one half times your base times your height. Uh, it doesn't matter who's who, but one of them is n plus 10 and one of them's n. And you could simplify this if you'd like. Um, I don't really want to because <laughs> now I'm just going to go ahead and evaluate it at 40. So one half, 40 plus 10 is 50 and then plug in 40 again. See, even I use the plug-in term. So not a... oh, I'm sure it's not going to do that in my head right now. So 1,000. They don't have any units here, but it's units squared. Good enough for me right now, guys. All right, area of a rectangle or any parallelogram for that reason um, would be base times height. It's not half, it's not a triangle. So base times height, some order of A times A plus B. And then if I'm evaluating A equals 8 and B equals 3, let's see, that's 8 times 11. So what is that, 88 units squared? And then this guy's a square, I could tell, because it's a, a little right degree angle here, a right angle here. And um, it's got all the sides congruent. So X plus Y times another X plus Y, also known as X plus Y squared. This time I know that X and Y are 12 and 5. Oh gosh, that's 17 squared. What is that, 89? Let's forget that one. Yeah, 289. Units squared, whatever those units are. All right, I think that concludes the lesson here. 
Um, I'm sure I assigned you some lovely practice following this lesson, possibly some book work. Remember, try not to use your calculator when possible, but then go back and check with your calculator, especially if it's a summative. If this is just practice for homework, I want you to make sure you check either in the back of the book for the problems I assign or check the binder of keys. Um, it's fine and dandy to practice all you want, but you want to make sure you're practicing properly.